Good morning, church family, and welcome to online worship for the fourth Sunday after Epiphany. I'm glad that you can join us in this video worship experience. One reminder as we get started that worship will continue to be online only for February as a safety precaution. We will make a decision about March worship at February's council meeting and we will let all of you know as soon as the decision has been made. And now friends, let us let the chimes bring us into worship. I invite all of you at home to join in on our call to worship. Your phrase this morning will be, when God speaks, we listen. So every time I gesture to you, I invite you to join in saying aloud at home the words, when God speaks, we listen. Join with me. Whether the Creator's words come to us loud and clear, or soft and whispered, when God speaks, we listen. Whether what the Spirit reveals is a well-worn truth, or a new, daring directive. When God speaks, we listen. Whether what Christ teaches is easy to understand or layered with mysterious meaning, when God speaks, we listen. And now, friends, I invite you to join also together in song, joining along with our opening hymn and following the words on your screen. Mighty power of God that bring the mountain toys, that spread the flowing seas abroad and build the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained us unto rule the day. The moon shines full at his command and all the stars obey. I sing the 
ultimate authority. God should be the one who guides all our decisions. But sometimes we put other authorities first and rely on less important things to guide us. So because we have all failed to put God first, let us confess together. Holy One, you show us how we should live in so many ways through your prophets, through your own work on earth, through those saints you inspire among us today. And still we turn to other examples, celebrities, politicians, the media, the pressure of our own peers. Sometimes these can be helpful. Sometimes they align with what you have shown, O oh God. But help us always to remember that your guidance should come first and that all other voices around us should be heard in light of your voice. And the people say, Amen. We take a moment also for our own individual confessions. When we let the words of others color God's word instead of the other way around, God forgives us. Though the people put the authority of the Roman state above his, Christ still willingly sacrificed himself for them and for us. Praise be to God.
prepared to read our scriptures. Incarnate Word, because we do not get to sit before you while you teach in person as our ancestors did, we rely on their recollections sacred because they are full of you. May your teaching continue to be as powerful for us as it was for them. And the people say, Amen. Our first reading comes from Deuteronomy. The speaker is Moses addressing the people who are finally about to enter the Holy Land. Moses knows that he will not be going in with them and is preparing them for what life will be like under his successors. In this passage, he describes for the people the role of a prophet and warns them about the consequences for prophesying falsely. We read from chapter 18, beginning at verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever see again this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, they are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or presumes to speak in my name a word I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. Here ends the first reading. For our second reading, we continue in the Gospel of Mark. The passage follows directly from last week's reading. So this is Jesus' first action after calling his disciples from their boats. Though only a handful of verses, the passage actually contains two stories. One story nestled inside the larger one. See if you can hear them both as we read from chapter 1, beginning at verse 21. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed and kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. 
At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This ends the readings for today. May their words be a light unto our path. A couple weeks ago, I noted that John is the weirdest of all the Gospels. We spent that sermon and the next comparing the different ways the first disciples are called in John and Mark. John's Gospel focused on the reasons the disciples gave for following. Mark's Gospel focused on the way in which they went about following, which was immediately. If John is the weirdest of all the Gospels, then Mark is the skimpiest. It's the shortest Gospel, and it's not only missing a number of stories found in Matthew and Luke, but also quite, but also cuts quite a few details from the stories they share. As the earliest written of the Gospels, part of this might be due to the fact that Mark assumes his readers still know the narrative details he leaves out. It's only been a generation or so since the cross. So in one sense, Mark's gospel could seem skimpy for us because he's writing when the details are so well remembered yet that it would be redundant to copy them down. But it's also clear that Mark has a very specific purpose for his gospel, one that every line is devoted to. Every line in Mark's gospel is about telling us who Jesus is. Not necessarily his teachings or his miracles, not the story of his life, but who he is is anointed one son of god savior details about the other things only make it in when they are part of that purpose to show us who jesus is which brings us to this morning's passage in the space of only eight verses, Mark gives us what is essentially two stories that highlight one single point. When we read the scripture, I asked you to see if you could pick out both, one nestled inside the other, and it's really not that hard once you're paying attention. The larger story is that of Jesus teaching in the synagogue and the amazement of people at the way he does it. And the smaller story nestled inside is of Jesus silencing and casting out a demon from a man in the synagogue, an unclean spirit. Both story, stories serve to establish the same thing, the authority of Jesus. In just eight verses, Jesus goes from a startup preacher with some strange magnetic quality that draws the fishermen to a teacher with such authority that it amazes everyone around him, causing word to spread of who he is. Now that's a loaded point to make. The idea of authority carries a lot of assumptions and a lot 
of emotions surrounding it. Just think about the way we use the word today. Think about who are considered authority figures in our world. There's lots, and they vary depending on where you are in life. For children and teens, their parents are an authority figure. For students, their teacher is an authority figure. For anyone who works in any sort of business hierarchy, unless they are at the very top as the president or owner, their boss is an authority figure. In some cases, such as with military rankings, the expectations for obeying that boss, that authority figure, are very strict indeed. And then there's the authority figures that most people are expected to recognize. Police officers, governmental agents and agencies, experts such as doctors and even car mechanics. In our society, we are surrounded by authority figures some with a very wide range of power and some with a very limited, specific range. It's hardly a wonder that you can turn to just about any book, movie, or TV series and find in it a storyline about someone resisting some kind of authority. With so many different figures claiming it, it's no wonder we want to resist somewhere along the way. Back to the people in Mark's world. Just like us, they have various authority figures in their lives. Government, which for them looks like Roman soldiers and Rome appointed officers. Parents and bosses, too, just like us. And they have their religious experts. The priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees. These are the ones to whom the people have been deferring as religious authority figures for centuries. By this point, even though the prophets are remembered, they are far back enough to be in the realm of once upon a time. In Mark's world, the scribes are an authority figure, which makes our passage today all the more significant. Along comes Jesus, and suddenly he teaches as one with authority, and yet not like the scribes. In other words, the authority Jesus exudes is so great as to put the former authority, the scribes, to shame. All their study and their careful commentary on the law now seem as nothing when Jesus teaches. Mark doesn't tell us what the actual teaching is in this passage because that's irrelevant. All that matters is that it establishes Jesus as having greater authority than anything else the people have known. The smaller story of the unclean spirit being cast out is included to support how strong Jesus' teaching is. The people don't murmur that he had the strength 
or the cleverness to cast out the spirit. They talk about how powerful this new teaching is, that even the demons listen because of it. A new teaching with authority. Even the demons obey. No wonder the people are astonished. No wonder word begins to spread. Now, we know the story doesn't end as easily as everyone who hears the word accepts Jesus as the new ultimate authority figure, and they all live happily ever after. If that happened, there wouldn't be the crucifixion and the all-important resurrection that follows which establish the pinnacle of who Jesus is, Savior. What happens instead is a clash of authorities. Even though the people can recognize that Jesus' authority is far beyond the scribes, the scribes and other religious experts don't want to give up their place as the authority figures. As we know, they clash with Jesus again and again. The Roman government, too, clashes with Jesus when his authority threatens theirs. The people for all their initial astonishment, still have to make a choice which authority to accept and which to resist. Not all of them choose to accept Jesus, not even most of them. Understanding Jesus' authority is not the same as accepting it. Being astonished at the new teaching is not the same as following it. And that's where we are again in the same situation as the people of Mark's Gospel. When I listed lots of the different authority figures in our lives today, I intentionally, intentionally left out the most important one, God. I mean, surely I didn't need to list God's authority for it to be sitting in the back of your head. But just like in Mark, there are going to be times when God's authority, Jesus' authority, clashes with some other authority figure in your lives. And at that point, having God sitting there in the back of your mind, acknowledging God's authority, isn't going to be enough. You're going to have to make a choice about whether or not to choose it above another. Now obviously, this isn't going to happen all the time or in all parts of our lives. You're probably never going to have to weigh God's authority against that of your car mechanic who's telling you why it's making that weird noise. It's not going to come into the equation. But depending on where you work, you might have to weigh God's authority against that of your boss 
who's telling you to disregard the needs of an individual in favor of the company. You might have to weigh God's authority against governmental authority like Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrestled with in Germany during Hitler's regime. You might even have to weigh God's authority against religious leaders such as popular televangelists or maybe the author of your current devotional. Much like Martin Luther did before you, resisting the Catholic leadership. Like the people of Mark's Gospel, and like so many Christians in whose footsteps you follow, you have to choose whether to stop at being in awe of God's authority or whether to accept it as the first in your life. When a clash arises, you have to choose whether to take Christ's new teaching and apply it or set it aside in favor of what is easy or expected or society approved. Unlike the people in Mark's gospel, you have the rest of the story. You have the pinnacle of who Jesus is, not just authority figure, not just Holy One of Israel, but Savior, willing to sacrifice all for you. Choose then. Choose what you are willing to do in return. Amen. Pray with me, church family. Precious Savior, you have chosen us above everything else in the universe. The galaxies and all their splendor were as nothing compared to drawing us, wanderers, rejectors, sinners, back to you. You who could have bent us to your will with a single command, chose instead to teach us what it was and show us your love that we might decide to do it for ourselves. You choose us in our freedom again and again whenever we stray and that is often. That's why you are savior above all and no more powerful a title could there be. It's to such awesome love that we pray for the strength to weather the challenges that are thrown at us by the world and the pandemic and the unique situations we each endure. For the patience to speak words of love, even when we are angry, to have hope, even when we are discouraged, and to be kind to others, and to be kind even when others have been unkind. For the warmth of your presence that comforts us 
when we grieve the loss of loved ones, when we persevere through illness, when we wait for things to get better. And finally, we pray for the wisdom to see your authority in our lives, to wander at the love behind it, and to choose you always, that we may earn the honor of being your church. We pray together as we have since the beginning when you taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. When we give of our treasure, it is but one way we show our trust in God as our authority figure. Remember that while we are separated physically, you can send whatever you choose to give to the church office or directly to our council president. During the offertory, meditate on the power of Christ's teaching in your life.
creator, redeemer, and sustainer. And in humility, we ask you to guide us to use them as you desire. And the people say, Amen. And now, please join in in singing along with our closing hymn, following the words on your screen.